The Reclamation of the Flesh. Written by Davy Perrin and narrated by Stephanie Usher. The titan mass of demonic flesh and hardened steel sat upon his prison throne, a furrowed brow adorning a face of anguish. This was a pain like none he had ever known. Chaos servitors swarmed around him, unleashing an array of plasmic energy pulses cauterizing him a hundred times a second. They were enhanced by the ungodly powers from the Immaterium, and with each pulse upon his pale skin came a mental prod, perturbing the Primarch. It was not a torture, at least not one by intent. It was a cleansing reclamation. Perturabo had taken this unholy form, a sacrifice forced upon him by they who dwell beyond, and the proud Primarch was nothing if not vain. This was not his flesh, so it must be excised. Outside the chamber's walls, the remnants of the Iron Warriors awaited their lord, who had so seldom spoken of his plans. They gathered outside the doors, listening to the wails and cries of their king, helpless to defend him. The demon prince gripped the iron skulls set into the armrests of the contraption that confined him strapped down tightly with sinewy chains that, to an undiscerning eye, appeared to be as much a part of him as the chair. He struggled against his binds, and the pain surged. Not just the physical pain from the tearing and searing of his hardened demon skin, but the mental anguish. It was like whips against his back, chunking away at the thin barrier that separated man from bone. The constructs of his mind fell away with each severing as the pendulous blade sliced away his hellborn dermis. Damn you! He cursed, staring beyond the void, through the Eye of Terror, and into the Imperium. Damn who? wondered the tongueless Olympian slaves, aiding the Primarch in this twisted contraption so far from their homeworld. The torment had just begun, but already the proud and arrogant Primarch beckoned for it to cease. His tortuous ingenuity had become a plague upon his form and with each wince, he reclaimed what he thought to be lost. The mechanism had been an ordeal to construct, the result of decades of planning as great designs churned in the Primarch's mind across all those countless sieges. He was reminded of Olympia whose horrors lay latent beneath a facade of reason, invention, and siegecraft. The brutal methods of Damacus's prisons came back to him vividly. As he endured his own suffering, it was as though he could feel the echoes of those old, harsh punishments 
transgressors beaten, confined, strung up and skinned, their torments meticulously meted out in proportion to their crimes. This self-inflicted agony mirrored those old memories, a grim reminder of the brutality he had once orchestrated. If suffering was the metric of monstrosity, then what have I? The thought disturbed the swirling maelstrom of Perturabo's fragmented mind. His lifetime had been one marked by relentless conquest, unending siege, and unbreakable logic, but also one doggedly shadowed by rejection, betrayal, and ultimately the burdens of demonhood. And this was his reclamation. He would not be denied it. For chaos's toxic touch taints the flesh of those who embrace it. To reject it is futile, but such is the power of the ardent mind. Perturabo had supposed this some time ago, as his horn was severed in the war amongst the scattered ruins of Cadia. His quest to recover what remained of the Necron pylons had failed, but yielded a truth that piqued the mind of the Primarch. In the numerous battles fought for terror and the Emperor, grievous wounds would heal at his behest, as did they with all the Emperor's sons and their post-human physiology. With chaos and the spoils of life unending, there was no such choice. To be flayed and reform was a gift any warrior would be foolish to reject. Such is the embrace of chaos undivided and its unholy riches. But as the lion awakened from his century sleep and severed Perturabo's horn, where the coils of neural enhancement had once lain, it was not pain that consumed Perturabo. Shame, he accused himself. To be vested by this crude warrior was a folly of his own. The bleeding wound did not heal, but only for a lack of want on the demon prince's behest. An accusatory echo of a voice resounded through the Primarch's mind in a moment of rare silence. You deserve this failure. Fall! It was a defeat incurred by his will, not the lion's. It was then that Perturabo understood the more practical truth. Should the flesh be severed and rejected, it shall grow never more. And so he had set out to rid himself of this karmic plague he'd endured for all these centuries as a servant of chaos. The mechanism was clever in its design. The subject was bound and interred, much like the improved demon engines he had employed. The machine was horrific in its scale, but thorough it needed to be to allow his ascent. It would start at the legs, cleaving the ankles and slicing the feet in thin layers. These were not clean cuts, as the unwieldy claws of a demon body had robbed him of finesse with his machinations. But they served their purpose nonetheless. Like blades of divine retribution, they tore skin from muscle and muscle from bone. Upon the exposing of the bone, the inner core drill could begin its work, piercing the osseous structure, piercing even onto the division of joints and marrow, scattering the unwanted tissue in its wake. Plumes of atomized gore erupted from the infernal engine as dust, 
lingering like oppressive clouds that began to fill the chamber. The air became thick with the putrescent stench of charred flesh. The roar of the machine would have deafened even the noise marines, if not drowned out by the screams of the wailing Primarch as it sculpted him. The process was arduous, as warp energies relentlessly, insistently, attempted to reform the flesh which had been stripped away, the Primarch barely managing to keep them at bay. Be gone, vile flesh, he commanded through gritted teeth. The flesh regrew anyway. Time crawled so slowly as a war was fought on the very body of the Supreme Siege Master. For every inch reclaimed, an inch taken, stasis unbroken. From the very depth of his consciousness, he reached out to his sons, urging them to aid him, yet in the same mental breath reversed the order, remembering the necessity of his course, cursing himself for his momentary weakness. Tumultuous were the minds of the Fourth Legion, much like their father, tossed back and forth like waves driven before the wind. The tedium had now grown more painful than the ache. Perturabo's booming voice reached above the whirring and clanking of the pain engines. <laughs> the Olympian slaves were hesitant. The bloodlust alone would drown in Astartes. But they obliged, and the suffering grew. Now the machine was reaving its way through the Primarch's leg, and he could do little except resist the temptations of chaos. How futile, he whispered in the agony. A demon rejecting chaos. It'd be laughable had his resolve not been ironclad like his once proud legion. This was a war like any other, he thought. What is pain except pleasure deferred? A Slaneshi revelation would not yield salvation here. Instead, it was something from within. The creed of his legion, etched in his mind amidst the entropic thoughts. Iron within! Iron without. Each syllable brought ancient memories to the front of his recollection, of conquest, of triumph, of siege. It was in that moment the Primarch realized that this was not just a war he was waging. It was a battle, a battle of attrition. At this thought, his will hardened and the shrill screams of true pain ceased. The slaves reviled and the chaos servitors jolted, as if reactive to what transpired before them. Pajarabo smirked. He thought then of his father, the Emperor. How ceaselessly cruel. His rejection and denial, how mocking his revel for the traitor Horus, how even now that spiteful god sits upon his throne of rot, suffering like his son is now. He had shunned the Imperium for their crimes against him, but in this newfound wisdom, he found splendor. The pain atrophied as the machine devoured his lower half. The whirring stopped, 
as the flesh-laden hall fell to silence beside the languid dripping of blood. Begin, uttered the Primarch. The slaves paused, a profound calmness in the pain-bearer before them. The tallest among them hefted the sarcophagus up from the abyss, struggling with all his might to pulley the immense cage from the abyssal void below. The doors of the opaque ceramite box were thrown open by two Olympians. Inside awaited a skeleton of iron and Primarch organs, forged from necrodermis like his brother's iron hand. Perturabo's fascination had been smothered and buried away beneath a bubbling facade of spite and petulance he had worn for all those years during the Great Crusade. Useless were such things he thought now to himself, though he understood little of how it worked. He knew only that it was powerful. A tool is a tool. The slaves hoisted the skeleton from the coffin, its weight so immense that even Perturabo had struggled in its forging. What could be a fond memory appeared before him now. The infamous forging fires of Nocturne, their strength and ferocity unmatched across all the known galaxy. He had snuck away to Nocturne, compelled to experience those greatest of forging flames that Vulcan had spoken to only him about. It was there that he had cast this new iron form, and it was now that he would don it. Oh, but how he had begrudgingly endured those many tedious arguments and squabbles between his brothers about who wielded supreme forging abilities. As Fulgrim and Ferris battled each other in the humble forge of the Imperium, Perturabo withheld that he alone was the strongest forger. As if in perverted judgment of this prideful memory, the machine speared the demon's spine with the screw affixed to the pelvis of the necrodermis. He felt the bones shatter in his back with a sickening crunch. Chains of lightning shot up and down his tormented body as his nervous system overloaded, sending him into violent spasms that wrenched what was left of his muscles and twisted his limbs grotesquely. Every nerve ending screamed in agony his jaw clamped shut, and he could taste the metallic tang of his own blood as he bit off his tongue. He could not help but wonder then. If Magnus had felt pain like this across the knee of Russ. But the thought was cut abrupt as the iron spine engaged and rotated, drilling its way through his bone structure, subsuming him. The worst had yet to come, as they prepared the second phase of his reclamation. Perturabo knew this, and yet had pushed the accursed thought out. They rotated his seat and prepared to engage the machine yet again, this part would be worse. For now, they would tear away at the body, ripping him limb from limb and refitting the superior machine form in its place. They began with his arm, clamping his wrist down tight with a reinforced iron vice. It was indiscriminate in its crushing of bone. They engaged it and he winced determined that no more cries would utter from his lips. 
Perturabo knew in designing this abomination that a crude ripping and replacing of the flesh would not be enough. That was the domain of the Mechanicum, of fools like Call. He knew that the flesh was not a weakness, but rather a blade to sharpen, a hammer to harden. In the same way that iron sharpens iron, a potter would mould his clay and a smith would forge his weapon, so too is the body owned through suffering, crafting it into what it needed to be. A warhammer with no hilt or handle was useless in the toppling of empires. What he needed was not for his demonic form to be removed. He needed it to be replaced. Vein for vein, bone for bone. The vice crushed his wrist into mist, leaving the exposed stump of his arm revealed. The work of chaos was generally crude, but the warp-born biology was complex. It made sense to him now how even the Emperor could not repair the damage done by the Butcher's Nails. But Perturabo was not the Emperor. He was something more, something beyond. He would not balk at such a meagre challenge. The machine went to work, injecting a liquid metal down each and every capillary and vein he had left. A sensation of immense burning flared down his arm, into his lungs and even into his heart, like a flame searing him from the inside out. Every gasping breath was fire. As his vascular system was scalded from within, the machine fit around his severed stump of an arm and clamped down tight to stymie the bleeding. A thousand needles each pricked him a thousand times a second, whittling his flesh into malleable meat to be burnt off. In the midst of this indescribable pain, Perturabo's sanity wavered and maniacal laughter burst from him, uncontrollable and wild, the sound echoing through the chamber, a testament to his mind nearing its breaking point as all are wont to do, demon prince or not. For surely, Fulgrim had somehow inadvertently inspired this design to cause as much delectable agony as possible, while not yet dying. As it flayed off thin slices, it seared the wounds to halt the unwelcome regrowth that not even a Primarch's infinite will could prevent. The torture took hours. But within a day, his left arm had been replaced. As the Primarch sat imprisoned in a cell of his own making, surrounded by his subject slaves, he took the briefest respite. Even then, the pain settled back in, and with each moment it worsened. The phantom sensations gnawed at him endlessly, like a scratch that could not be itched. The reprieve ended as he nodded for the slaves to begin anew. As the crimson-soaked blades of the agony machine began to whir and clamp down upon his right wrist, it sputtered to a stop, and a deafening clank reverberated through the brutalist halls. It shook the platform suspended by chains from the ever-stretching ceiling. Impossible, he muttered. Seldom had a machine of his own design failed him, and if it had, it surely was the work of chaos. The tall Olympian who was supposed to be tending the machinery stared at the Primarch, like an innocent animal in the path of a Lehman Rust tank. Repair it, or you will be in this seat next, slave, he plainly stated. 
It was a mercy that they'd survived even this long, for how many hundreds had perished at this Primarch's hand, who he had called son? How swiftly they sprinted to the rear of the machine, in fear of the wrath incurred, clueless about where to begin. They pulled at the metal bars to no avail. A mere minute had passed before the Primarch's anger turned to fury, and he ripped himself from the binds of his seat. The vice keeping his demonic hand as blood spewed from the newly torn stump. It was a pleasure compared to what he'd experienced. This new form was strong, far stronger than the mere demon flesh that had possessed his body for those accursed years. The cold steel of his hand gripped the head of the Olympian he dwarfed in size. He crushed it like a grape, with no resistance from the man's feeble human body. The slaves scattered as he shoved his hand past the iron bars and into his machine, being careful not to do any more damage. Of course, he thought to himself, as he withdrew his hand covered in a viscous, sticky fluid. The Primarch's blood had clotted so aggressively and rapidly that it had stalled the motor within. The damned fools should have known, he roared. The slaves recoiled, confounded as to why their lord had referred to them in the past tense. They would never realize, as they found their resting place as a splattered stain on the rusted platform in an instant. The chaos servitors watched as the machine roared to life with greater vigor than before, almost singing with anticipation. Days passed as the Primarch slaved away alone in the hold. It was slower than he would have liked, but he was thorough. By the seventh day, drunk in the stupor of pain, he was ready to undertake the final step to his reclamation. He approached the sarcophagus with an almost religious reverence. Pain had been his master, and pious he was. Two organs remained for the Primarch to install in this post-demon shell. His brain and his heart. He toiled over this for ages, debating how far to go, how much of this cancer to rip from his body. Surely his tainted heart was too far gone. But his mind? Did this accursed brilliance deserve to reside in the shell of the new iron demigod? This damned mind, after all, had driven him to madness to embrace his lesser emotions and to bend the knee to chaos. Pitiful was the only word he could bring to the Vox module he had installed just moments ago. He raised his steel hands to graze his temples, crudely welded together. He could feel nothing, but the motions gave him momentary comfort a trait from his days studying on Olympia. His quantum of solace reversed as his fingers pulled his forehead away, exposing the mind that had betrayed him so many times. He would have little time, he understood. The effects of this were devastating should he fail. He had endured so much in his time since Horus's coup. So much anger. So much pain. So much death. Even if it all ends here, it was better than continuing on as that pale failure, he reasoned to himself, pondering the metallic brain in his palm. 
It was born from the remaining gene seed that had once fashioned him by the Emperor's hand. By all measures, it should be identical to his current brain, just untainted by the memories of who he once was. Should he die, he would never know it. But at least it'd be a death by a hand triumphant, and not some scheme or plot by a lesser mind whom the gods of luck blessed upon that day. He pulled a coil from the crook of his neck. His memories, a failsafe, a mockery, an STC if he was to be believed. And he placed it in the mag field of the nearby servitor, staring into its eyes. How easy a destiny, he thought, reaching into his skull and ripping out the brain, tossing it to the ground below to be forgotten. It splattered and gushed, mixing with the blood of the Olympian slaves who had just died there. The neural overrides engaged, and for a moment he was outside himself. The sensation was strange, like floating in the void, untethered. The motor controls on his protoform engaged and placed the new mind in its home. His skull closing on its own, wires connecting themselves as if possessed by some machine god, bending to its will as they weaved. The eyes of the Neo Primarch opened, absorbing the sight of what lay before him, contemplating it. Not yet accustomed to his new body, his movements were stiff and jerky, his head pivoting only along the vertical axis. He gazed at the new heart that awaited him for a long, long time. This creation, born of his own genetic material, masterfully crafted and nurtured with the recovered sciences thought lost so many years ago. Perturabo, whatever he was now, analyzed it carefully. The bionic eyes scanned the valves and aorta of the pulsing, bleeding organ. He stood up straight, a movement inhuman. His heavy steps echoing through the chamber as he exited his prison, still carrying his chaos-tainted heart within him. The new heart would remain here, untouched and unneeded. The door opened and he emerged, victorious. Looking over his loyal legion, they paused as they looked back at the hulking mass of flesh and metal that was their new king. The Iron Emperor, they named him, and they knelt before him, the thundering of a thousand knees shaking the floor as they prayed. As his new mind struggled to formulate a thought, one truth echoed within. There are fates far worse than death. Perturabo engaged his Vox module to proclaim a single phrase over his sons. Iron within! His sons, replying in unison, Iron without! Without.